listening to the Art of Homeschooling podcast, where we help parents cultivate creativity and connection at home. I'm your host, Jean Miller, and here on this podcast, you'll find stories and inspiration to bring you the confidence you need to make homeschooling work for your family. Let's begin. Well, hey, hey, my friends, and welcome to episode 27 here on the podcast. And I am so excited today because I get to talk about one of my very favorite topics, which is movement games and um, different kinds of movement activities in the homeschool setting. And I have a special guest. So I'm really excited to be talking with Brian Wolf from Waldorfish. Hey, Brian. Thanks for having me. Yeah, I'm so glad you're here. And a super fun discovery when Brian and I got to meet in person, finally, is that we both love this topic, right? So we're both really, um, really inspired and encouraged and, and love having conversations about how to weave more movement, right, and and games and things into the learning. So here we are. I'm going to start off uh, by introducing Brian, and then we're we're just going to have a chat about each of our experiences teaching uh, and in different settings. I mean, we probably have like 50 years of experience <laughs> teaching, right, between the two of us. So. Um, yeah, so I'm going to give a little introduction to Brian, then we're going to talk about each of our own experiences, and we're going to give you some really great ideas uh, for how you can weave more movement and game type of activities into your homeschooling day, because it really does help provide a fabulous foundation for learning. All right, so let me first introduce you to Brian Wolf from Waldorfish. <clears throat> So for the past 17 years, Brian has been teaching art, games, and geometry in Waldorf classrooms, as well as coaching middle school and high school basketball. In addition to teaching online with Waldorfish, he's traveled as far as China to mentor parents and teachers in a Waldorf-ish style. Brian has developed a calm, practical approach to teaching with equal parts fun and playful sarcasm mixed in. When he's not noodling on his guitar, you'll find him cooking big meals for his family, practicing kickboxing with his stepdaughter, playing Dungeons and Dragons with his stepson, painting in the garage, waxing poetic about geometric geometry in the golden mean, and playing with the family cats. <laughs> so I'm so happy to have you here to talk about this, this great topic of movement games. So thanks for joining me today. Yeah, thanks for having me. This is awesome. Yeah, really great. And uh, I thought we could just start off with a little bit about your experience teaching uh, and parenting and all the things. And so t- just tell me, cause I don't even know this story. I don't think where did your journey begin as a teacher? Yeah. If I go all the way back, um, my, my summer job in high school, I worked for a, um, an occupational therapist. Huh. And, and I would go in and my job was to play with the families of the patients. So there were there were children who were being treated. And my job was to come up with games and art for these families because <laughs> I was a kid. So um, so that was really where it started for me. That is great. And then um, so let me just interject. I find that occupational therapists really are dialed in, like they get the importance of play, right? Play, yeah, yes, play and and movement. Just yes. feel and touch and movement and yeah. Yeah, it's really yeah. therapy through moving and being in the world. So yeah, yeah, and getting more comfortable in your body. Such a yeah. great yeah, yeah. And so 
you know, if I back up even further, my mom was a teacher, public school, taught uh-huh. fourth grade for like 30 years. Oh my gosh. And so that, that's really where it started. Mm-hmm. And I was sure that I was never going to be a teacher because I saw how hard the job was for her. Um, but I didn't know I was like built on this path, building um, this love of working with kids. Hmm. Uh, and then so moving forward from there, you know, it's kind of interesting. Um, there's basketball in my bio and <laughs> that was my path to Waldorf. Oh, interestingly enough, um, a friend of a friend of my mom's, um, I, so I was about, I was maybe 20, 22, 23 years old, um, was studying anthropology in college, no idea what to you, what to do, mm. didn't know what I wanted to do, um, and I was working night shifts in a warehouse at the newspaper, <laughs> and uh, I really just I was really in a rut and stuck and then and this friend of a friend of my mom's calls and says there's this little Waldorf school northern California that needs a basketball coach eighth grade girls basketball coach oh my gosh and I and I I was thinking you know high school basketball was a long ways away I hadn't even thought about it um and I didn't even have a concept of what an eighth grader was. <laughs> uh, so, but I, I, I talked to the school. I showed up um, on the, the, my first day to kind of meet the teachers and meet the kids. And this was a little Waldorf school. Never heard of Waldorf before. Didn't know anything about it. And I walked up to the, um, I remember walking to the office you know, and it's, this is a very rustic um, countryside Waldorf school. Mm-hmm. And I walked up to the office and said, uh, I'm the new basketball coach. I'd only talked to people over the phone. And they said, and I said, um, I'm the new basketball coach. I'm just looking for the gym. <laughs> and so this, this uh, person at the front desk walk front desk walks me down to the parking lot and says, when all those cars pull away, that's the, that's the basketball gym. (laughs) There's a little (laughs) wooden basketball hoop on the side there. And, uh, and I, and I remember walking past and there's like, there's like woodworking and uh, the third grade, you know, I didn't know what I was seeing at the time, but the third grade is doing cooking and they're churning butter. And uh, so I just thought, you know, what is this place? (laughs) Wow. Um, Oh my gosh. That's a funny way in, you know, like that, you didn't even know about it, about the approach. Yeah. Yeah. And it was, so to answer your question, working with the the family of this little basketball team, six kids, you know, one sub (laughs) and uh, um, it was the connection of the, the families and the, that atmosphere, mm-hmm. uh, that was my in. And they pulled me aside and said, um, you need to go to Steiner College. Wow, that's and, really cool. So fascinating to me. You know, when I was in graduate school, I, for, for teaching, uh, and, you know, I was a public school teacher before I had kids. I taught junior high and high school English. And, but in grad school, there was no mention of Waldorf. There was talk about Montessori, you know, there was talk about hands-on learning, but Waldorf didn't even come up, not once. And uh, it, that's really interesting to me because then I was a classroom teacher and then got more and more uh, disenchanted and and discouraged from seeing really the the lack of curiosity. That's really what it was in kids who were, you know, 15, 16, broke my heart. And then I thought there, there has to be a a better way. And it's so interesting that you mentioned the art and the movement, because to me, those are two of the key um, components of really good learning and at the same time, if we bring it around to homeschooling, it's also, for most of us, 
We didn't have a Waldorf education ourselves. So when we are bringing this approach to our kids, it's something we're not very familiar with, the art and the movement. It can be challenging, right, to to lead those (laughs) activities in, in our homeschools. So very interesting. Okay, so the corollary question for you then, before we really dive into all of that, is um, when did your love of movement begin? I mean, clearly you had basketball in your background, and so you had your own experiences with it. But in terms of the teaching, like with the kids, you know, related to uh academics or, you know, the actual lessons, like, where did that come? Tell us, tell us the next chapter. (laughs) Yeah, that's a, that's a good one. (laughs) Um, Well, I grew up um, like a lot of people, public school, where it was just kind of expected as a young boy that you're going to, you're going to play sports. And, um, and I had an active, family. Um, but I never considered myself a natural athlete or a great athlete. I just tried hard and I liked, that was kind of my social. Mm -hmm. And, and then I had kind of left it behind after high school. It's kind of like one of those things where you, you you kind of, you know, you get through PE and sports and, um, but my love of movement really came back with Waldorf with, um, through basketball again, but then that was kind of the in. And then, so my first job at this, at a different Waldorf school, my first actual teaching job, I was hired to be the art teacher and the games teacher. <laughs> yeah. And I think what I realized was that I could go into a first grade classroom And I could ask, I could say, raise your hand if you're an artist or raise your hand if you like to play games and everybody's hand goes up. But then if you go into an eighth grade classroom or a room full of adults and say, who likes to play games and who is an artist? Not so many hands go up. (laughs) Um, And there's, sorry for the noise there. Um, There's just this moment where we all start um kind of labeling everything like am I an artist am I an athlete am I what am I good at what am I bad at and I think that's where my love of teaching movement and art comes from that that moment of realizing um that those are two things that get lost yeah for people and, and become really challenging to teach yeah 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 So, you know, that reminds me so much of that little snippet of a story I just told about being a classroom teacher because I decided after teaching high school English, right, and these juniors and seniors just were flat. They had, they, they just weren't curious about the world anymore. And I thought, you know what, I need to go back to the beginning, And so I worked in a Montessori classroom because still I'd never heard of Waldorf. I worked in a Montessori three to six year old classroom because it was the most like hands on approach that I knew of. Mm -hmm. You know, and that idea, it's it's tragic to me, that idea that by the time kids are teenagers or even adults, we no longer retain we don't retain that playfulness or that sense of exploration that we can experience through art we've kind of uh I don't know it's just gone gone the way of childhood like you said yeah and it's really that idea of um is learning just all in our brain or is it our whole body yes and so easy to sit at a desk and just be in our heads and and adults are, we're so programmed to just be in our heads. <laughs> oh, so programmed. I mean, I still, after 30 years of teaching, I, I have to remind myself to get out of my head. Right. And yeah, it, it, this is reminding me. So the very first, there was, um, many, many years ago, uh, Rahima Baldwin, do you know who she is? She wrote the book, you're your child's first teacher. 
Yes. Yeah. yeah. Well, she would organize for a number of years. She organized these Waldorf homeschooling conferences in Ann Arbor, Michigan. And I went to the very first one. And I think my boys were like three, three and four, maybe at the time. And uh, I, I was very interested in homeschooling. So we were going to give it a try. And one of the workshops that I went to, it was, was presented by um, a man named Tom Schaefer. And he is part of the spatial dynamics movement. I've met him a few times. Yeah. And so that's um, a lot of Waldorf schools. It's like you being the games teacher, right? They, they, the spatial dynamics organization trains people to teach movement. Mm-hmm. And one of the, so we're in this huge gymnasium, right? At the Ann Arbor Waldorf School in a big circle. It's like the first big circle I ever yeah. participated in. And Tom leads us in some clapping games and uh, and talks about, he describes how so he's observed that so many homeschoolers are really lacking in the in the area of movement, right? So so in a lot of ways, as homeschoolers, even as Waldorf inspired homeschoolers, I think we try, to replicate a classroom and our it's colored by our own experiences, you know, public school educated here also, it's colored by our own experiences um, where we, you know, we picture sitting at a desk. Right. Yeah, yeah. So wanting to bring, and that was my way into this love of movement and games. You know, I had these two very active little boys. My first two, our our youngest is a daughter, but the first two, 16 months apart. And I was so aware of how much movement they needed every day. Like they would sleep better. They would behave better, you know, all the things. And so I really, that was our, our part of our motivation to homeschool was being able to have a lot more flexibility during the day to get outside, to play games, to do some of these movement activities. Yeah. It it makes me, um, what you're what you're saying makes me think of the, you know, in Waldorf, the think, feel, do, the head, heart, hands. Yes. Idea. And I, I've always thought about how, as adults, we um, we think first. We're always in our heads, and then yeah. we decide how we feel, and then we act based on our thoughts and our feelings. Yeah. Uh, and kids are so opposite. They just you know, they just do stuff. They want to do stuff and try it. And then that brings up feelings. And then the thinking is kind of the last part sometimes. So for sure. I have, I teach that all the time in, in my membership homeschool with Waldorf, because I think it's so important. Like we know we're familiar often. We're familiar with the phrase thinking, feeling, willing, or think, feel, do. Right. And so then we think that applies across the board and it doesn't, that's the for age 14 and up approach to learning. Just I've, I've, always, I've always felt like it's not an it's not a coincidence that saying uh, now go think about what you've done because <laughs> you've already you, you know your kids just do stuff and then yeah the thing comes comes later sometimes and that's like totally okay it's totally okay it's actually yeah that is the the way the way I describe it is that. Um, at each of these different stages of development, right? So up till age seven, seven to 14 and 14 and up, there is a primary way in. (laughs) And for 14 and up and adults, that is thinking. But for children until the age of seven, it's doing, right? And then for children seven to 14, it's feeling, but doing comes very quickly right after that. It's the thinking piece that, um, that takes longer and is not their natural, like first response, like first interest. And, and I think if we want to honor the developmental, you know, stage of, of children, we, we have to be aware of that. Right. Yeah. 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 And that's all about meeting them where they are and uh, building rapport and all those things that are the ways in. 
Yeah, for sure. So yeah, so I was very aware that my kids needed, you know, lots of time to dig in the dirt and climb trees and do all of those things. And then we we did start homeschooling and I discovered bean bags. Yes. <laughs> I want to talk about bean bags with you because I think bean bags are magical. You know, they're great for um, learning verses and warming up and learning math and all kinds of different activities. Um, And I know that in conversations with, you know, hundreds, maybe more homeschoolers at this stage, you know, I, I know that this idea of circle time doesn't always work at home, you know, when you have two kids instead of 20, but I still you know, we'll share with, with parents that you can do a shorter warm up, or you can weave these movement activities into the lessons themselves, or, you know, sprinkle them in throughout the day. Um, but I find that, that beanbags are a great, a great place to start. Oh yeah. yeah. Um, and that idea of, forcing circle time. It's really, it's okay to um, improvise and just try everything and see what works. And, um, but, oh, I love beanbags. I didn't understand. I didn't discover beanbags until I was in my twenties as a, as a Waldorf teacher. Yeah. Um, but everything from, you know, like I was thinking about you, uh, while I was listening to you thinking about flashcards, like doing mm. math problems and yeah. how, um, just how monotonous that can be <laughs> for everybody. <laughs> and, uh, you know, just the idea of, uh, can we do math problems, just tossing a beanbag back and forth, right hand, left hand, passing them back and forth. Yep. Uh, yeah. All, there, there's so many great things to do with beanbags. Yeah. And I have a, be- I do have a beanbag story for you if you're. Oh, I would love to hear it. Yes. Because I do, I think beanbags help a lot with retention too. I'll, I'll share more about that in a second. So yeah, let's yeah. hear your story. Well, I was going to ask you first, um, with your, with your sons, um, did you have, did you feel a dilemma or a challenge in trying to balance sitting at a desk versus playing outside and moving? Yeah, for sure. For sure. You know, I, I at first felt like, and this is, this is my own, um, like, I think we can't help but do this, but imposing my own perception of the world onto them, right? That, that Mm -hmm. you somehow progress to being able to sit still at a desk for more and longer and longer periods of time. And so I, at first I really thought, well, there, there's something wrong here. Right. And then I, I, um, I felt like I needed to stop them right from when they were engaged in having a grand old time outdoors that I needed to stop them and bring them in for lessons. And I had to work around that in a lot of different ways. Some, some years when they were younger, we would, um, I would have to move from breakfast into lessons right away so that then they could get outside because if they went outside first, it was really hard to regroup. Yeah. 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 It, the balance is hard, I think for, um, for all of us, because when our kids are playing happily, we don't really want to interrupt them, but we also have uh, some lessons to bring to them. So, you know, my advice, this is what I found ended up working for me was that I could say, you know, we created a rhythm chart, we hung it on the wall and, you know, for this 90 minutes or these two hours, four days a week, we're going to have lesson time. And during that lesson time, we're going to be probably indoors. Sometimes we were out on the porch. But, you know, doing more what might look like book learning, but with a lot of movement, you know, woven in. And then there was still plenty of time in the day for the the bigger outdoor explorations. Yeah, I've that that's awesome. And it's I think it causes anxiety for some people to try to think, 
you know, when is, when is my kid going to be able to sit at a desk and work? Yeah. <laughs> well, I had that with my stepson where it was like, he was hanging off the side of the desk and falling on the floor and tipping the chair over. Um, and so my story has to do with that transition back and forth. Mm. Uh, and I thought you, I thought you'd get a kick out of this. <laughs> so my, my very first year teaching at a Waldorf school, so new, I didn't know anything. And um, I used to go into the first grade classroom at the end of their main lesson and then have snack with them and then take them out for, for games class. after mm -hmm. snack. And um, it was just a way to kind of just build a connection with them. And so I noticed that the teacher was struggling with with a brand new class of first graders trying to sit in their chairs because it's totally new for them to have like main lesson and desks and chairs because, because kindergarten and preschool had been so outdoor play based for yes. them at this school. And, um, and I'm coming from this coaching, this, you know, public school coaching background, grew up in a military family and, um, where, you know, we, you want to just discipline people and make them do it. And, yes. you know, there's so many ways to make people do things, right? Like you can yes. take things away, you can threaten, you can force, you can uh, raise your voice. Yeah. And I'll, so I'll never forget this. Um, the teacher, this just incredibly gentle man um, with the, these brand new first graders, he goes to the handwork teacher and asks her to have the kids each make their own special beanbag. Oh. Uh, and he's just kind of like doing the best he can with the, this the very rambunctious class. Um, and each kid makes their own beanbag. So they have, you know, they've, there's like a lot of pride around making your own thing. Mm -hmm. And I'm kind of watching uh, throughout the the next few weeks as they finish their bean bags and now all the bean bags have these little personalities they're all connected to each student huh. um, and then he tells them uh, okay so sometimes our bean bags are going to be the teacher and sometimes we're going to teach the bean bag uh -huh. so he brings it into circle time and activities and the bean bags are always there they're they're handing them to each other, playing catch, tossing them, but they're really showing a lot of care for these bean bags. Mm -hmm. uh, and then uh, I think there's probably more to the story that I'm forgetting, but <laughs> then one day I walk in and the, the class is walking around um, and they're counting and they're walking as they count with the bean bags balanced on their heads. Mm -hmm. uh, just being able to move your body and count at the same time is can be challenging, let alone balance the beanbag on your head. Yeah. Um, and I thought, okay, well, it just seems pretty simple. Uh, but the moment of brilliance that I saw in this teacher, um, he said one day, um, all right, class, do you guys think, do you think we can, um, or he asked the class, what did, what did our beanbags um, teach us about um, balance? Mm. You know, what did we have to do with our bodies to hold the beanbag on our head or balance it on our elbow or our shoulder? So they all talked about it. And then he said, do you think, do you think we could teach the chairs what the beanbags taught us? Oh my God. About how to balance our bodies? <laughs> wow. And, uh, and, you know, of course, like somebody's going to make a joke and fall over in their chair and yeah, yeah, yeah. like they're, they're still kids, but, but I saw the, like the, they know, they know, cause they had it in their whole bodies because he taught them through movement and the beanbag. Um, they got the point. That is Great. Oh my gosh. I have this phrase that I feel like sums up the Waldorf inspired approach, which is the experience before the explanation. And yes. 
kinds of little surprises, right? Where you actually allow the child to have the full experience of that and then relate it to something else. (laughs) Yes. And that's, and that's that I think you just summed up um, teaching through movement. You get it through your whole, get it in your whole body. Yes. And then you can think about it all you want. (laughs) Yeah, exactly. And I find that even though children age 14 and up and adults, right, including us right here, even though our primary way into learning new material is through our thinking, we still benefit enormously from the feeling and the doing And that's what rounds things out. And sometimes there's healing to be done, right? From from our own childhoods where we didn't have those kinds of experiences. Yeah. And I think that's where um, the idea of striving really comes in, that our kids learn more from seeing us strive to do our best than they do from us being experts. Yep. Um, yeah, that is something that is just so important for homeschooling parents to hear over and over. I mean, if somebody had reminded me of that every day for all the year, 25 years I was homeschooling, it wouldn't have been enough. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's so true. Um, like, wouldn't it be great if they, if their memory was that we tried our best, (laughs) we did everything we could. Yeah. it wasn't perfect, but we tried our best. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Right. That is, that is the best we could ask for, isn't it? Oh, that is a great story. You know, there, and it's when we get stuck in our heads, I find that it's very hard to think about uh, creative ways of teaching something, but also that story, there's surprise in there too. Right. Or there's a there's a um, a new twist on what they've learned that they weren't expecting the children. Yeah. And, and, and it, it pulls in the, the it builds like a narrative or, or a story yeah. that they can live into. Yeah. Yeah. It extends the learning. Right. That's exactly what we're going for. So I just love that. Oh, my gosh. Thank you for sharing that story. It's, um, I have so many fond memories of, uh, making bean bags. I think children making their own bean bags is, is just so, uh, such a wonderful handwork project because they can personalize them. And then, and then they, they do, they become, um, treasured objects, right. In, in our homeschool lives, uh, and, uh, yeah, I'm going to link to a couple of resources at the end uh, or in the show notes. Anybody listening, you can go find the show notes at artofhomeschooling.com slash episode 27. And I'll link an article on my website that gives just super simple instructions for, for stitching bean bags, making bean bags out of felt and beans. <laughs> um, so much fun. So I have a lot of fun memories too of, you know, that idea when I was talking about circle time, sometimes it feels like too small of a group, right? In a homeschool setting. So I often encourage people to homeschoolers to find, you know, even neighborhood kids or cousins or, you know, homeschool co-ops or whatever to, to do some games together. So I remember one year for our homeschooling co-op, I offered a, a You know, everybody had to help or teach or something in some way in this co-op, all the parents. And I offered a group games class. And I thought, this is so silly. Like, they're going to think it's silly. I knew the importance of all the movement and stuff. But the kids were over the moon. They loved this, right? And we met at a local park. And we did the simplest things, like two milk crates and a jump rope and we played tug of war and they tried to not fall off the milk crate. Right. I mean, games that they had never played. (laughs) Oh yeah. And, and they'll take it and run with it. And it's, and isn't it funny how adults, like even being a sports person, I remember feeling kind of funny playing those kinds of games when I first started teaching, but 
they sure love it. They, they love, and they love seeing their parents act like kids. Yeah, for sure. Oh my gosh. Like something as simple as, um, uh, put the math answers to the math questions on pieces of paper throughout the house or the living room and do, do things like, uh, read the math problem, but then we're going to bear crawl to the, to find the answer or yeah. sliver like a snake or do the zoo exercises. Um, yeah. 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 So so another one of my favorite resources is um, a book by Kim John Payne. He wrote Simplicity Parenting, but his very first book is called Games Children Play. Children play. Oh, yeah. <laughs> so good. And so a couple of things, I wanted to read a quote from the beginning of that book because I just think this is such a fascinating concept. And he says that uh, movement games give us a sense of freedom and a sense of direction. And that movement is the origin of our sense of purpose. Isn't that just so fascinating? Brilliant teacher. Brilliant. (laughs) Brilliant. And in that book, it was the first time reading that, the intro to that book was the first time that I was really exposed to this, this aha of, you know, kids in every single culture all over the world from the beginning of time have made up games, right? They invent games, you know, out in the courtyard or in the dirt or, you know, in the neighborhood, And the importance, you know, our kids now, we have to actually teach them (laughs) these games because they didn't grow up with them. And yet it's just like you were saying, and I was saying, observing children, it feels a little awkward at first, but then when we observe the children, they really do take off with these games. I mean, there, there's so many different types of games, right? Clapping games, jump rope games, running, chasing, hiding. I mean, there, it's, it's, uh, a wonderful world to explore. Yeah. Well, and there's that idea that um, by playing and playing games and making up games. And one of my favorite things that Kim John Payne talks about are the stages of play. Mm-hmm. And, you know, how important it is at, at a young age, you know, kindergarten, preschool um, to just play because they're trying to figure out where they where they end and the, the, uh, what, how do I say that? Where, where do I end and where does everyone else start? Yeah. <laughs> what are the boundaries? What can I do? It's, it's a way to, to test how the wor- world works in a fun way. And, uh, yeah, he really summed it all up there. Yeah. Well, and so to extend that beyond, so those early years, I mean, I do feel like a lot of educators now are beginning to embrace that, right? Finally, this idea that, that young children actually learn through play. That's, that's part Mm -hmm. of the, like, it's a mechanism of learning just as you described, right? And so then we don't want to suddenly stop that, (laughs) in first grade and and move to something completely different, we want to invite children forward through that that, uh, world of play that they now are comfortable with and have explored so fully and bring that into into the learning. And it really does then um, create this much more holistic Uh, view of the child, right? That idea of head, heart, and hands, and it really helps to embrace children where they are developmentally, like we mentioned. Yeah. Yeah. And, and when I, when, when I hear you say that, it's that imitation, Mm. imitation is really important there. And it sometimes gets lost when it's just filling out a packet or sitting in front of a computer. So Yes. Yeah. And, you know, the converse of that is it can even get lost in a homeschool setting because we, um, I just think parents and teachers, we, we, we take on this responsibility, right. Of teaching children. And it, it is a big responsibility. And sometimes it feels so huge that we, that we want to rush it or something. 
Yeah. It's, it's hard to give ourselves a break. <laughs> 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 it's hard to give ourselves a break. But then we also, then we also, like, I know I, I can beat myself up for like, well, that was, that was not an inspiring uh, session that we just had or. <laughs> right. Uh, well, and that, you know, games and play sometimes feel like extras, you know, like that they're yeah. not that sure they're fun and maybe it's easier and all of that as long as we sort of have an idea of a list of a few ideas of activities to do, but it isn't extra. So that's what I want to, I hope all of you listeners are hearing that Brian and I are giving you permission to shift your thinking into like being able to embrace play and games and movement activities um, embrace them as learning activities, really, right? As part of the learning. So if you need a little more permission, I'm just going to read a couple of things that play and and not just play, but games and movement can bring uh, to a developing child, right? They're rhythmic. They help build awareness and focus, actually. So that idea of, you know, the, the kids falling off their chairs or when you were talking about your stepson and wondering, like, what's normal here? <laughs> I had the same with my my boys. They'd be, like, tapping pencils on the table or, you know, making little so- mouth sounds or whatever while we were doing lessons. And then I remember reading an article about how um, – the neurology of of developing brains is that that those movements they need movement right so those movements are actually helping them focus even though it's distracting sometimes to us um so that idea of movement builds awareness and focus and uh it helps to ch- children to develop their senses and that, that um, their balance in so many different ways, mentally and physically, their sense of balance. So I like to say, you know, one of my mantras is we, we want to warm up our bodies so we can get our minds ready for the lessons, right? And then keep weaving the movement in all day long. Keep moving, yep. Yeah, yeah, keep moving. Yeah. It's, it's interesting to me because Steiner himself, when he, when he developed that first Waldorf school, he had this sense about all of this, but he didn't have the science to back it up. And now, you know, neurology, neuroscience is finally really catching up and seeing that, um, you know, movement is really important. I, I, I'm heartened to see that teachers, even in classrooms, some of them have yoga balls instead of chairs, right. Right. They take brain, what they call brain breaks, and they weave movement in because we now know from a scientific perspective that this is healthy, right, for children and learning. Yeah. And we can see it with all you have to do is walk into a, a kindergarten and see how important play is. It's not, it's, uh, Yes. It's right there. <laughs> it is right there. Yeah. Yeah. And so that that role of the of the observer, right? As an adult and as a teacher, um, the importance of observing so that uh we can see where the learning is happening, right? We can see it blossoming. I think it's fascinating back to your beanbag story that you you know, when you went in to, to have snack with those first graders and then take them out for some games, you you were in the presence of a brilliant educator, right? Who had experience observing the children and bringing them what they needed. Right. And, and I'm the first to say that I, you know, I never would have thought of that. We, it's just the more we can observe and um, just kind of try everything. Like there's no one right way to do it all. We just, we just watch and learn and try stuff and mm-hmm, mm-hmm. It's be okay. <laughs> yeah. And it's going to be okay. So as we wrap up, I, I want um, us to just share a few really concrete ideas that homeschoolers can, um, can embrace at home to integrate more movement into their day and uh, and that idea that you just shared about how um, we really can 
Like our role is to observe and to experiment. And for some reason with the Waldorf approach in particular, but I think this is true for teachers in general, for some reason, we think our job is to find out how to do the right way to bring the lessons to the children and then do it. (laughs) And then we think that's it. (laughs) And really it's, it's experiment. See how it goes change up a few things, try again. (laughs) Try things like, like counting while you walk and see if the, if the math is in their body, just little simple things. Right. Yeah. 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 So I just, as we wrap up, do you, do you have any other specific ideas for what um, things homeschoolers could do to bring more movement to the day, you know, throughout the day or during, during a warm up time, circle time kind of setting? Yeah. So just starting with the beanbag, um, just balancing the beanbag, head, shoulders, you know, um, hands, tossing the beanbag back and forth um, when you're asking questions, answering questions. That's kind of like this physical um, give and take, like learning to communicate with the bean through the bean bag. Mm-hmm. Um, and um, I guess I would say anytime that it feels like you're just sitting in a chair at a desk, just to kind of think, how can I, how can I move? Is there, can we, can we go for a walk and learn this stuff? Can we go to the park and work on this lesson? Um, and um, yeah, and just kind of kind of build a rhythm into it. I mean, there's so many games and um, and things you can play. And I love the way that you found some other people to play. And hopefully, um, hopefully, in the near future, we'll be we'll all be able to play <laughs> together again. And right. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. um, You know, a couple of other things that that makes me think of is um, just that one of my favorite ways of using beanbags is to memorize poetry, you know, to memorize verses or songs, because it really the movement helps us remember, (laughs) right? It's easier to to if you've ever try this experiment, you can try this experiment at home. where you you try to memorize a poem just straight up or m- try it memorizing a poem while adding in some movement. It could even be clapping if you don't have bean bags, right? Oh, it's but, so so great for poetry. Yeah, yeah, because it's so rhythmic. It's a rhythmic language, right? And uh and so um it's just a super helpful helpful way. And to me, this is movement is just one of these lively arts, right? Um, I did an episode, I think it's 25 all about the lively arts, but it, it's one of the ways that we can bring the learning alive, that we can help to make um, the learning more engaging so that children retain it better, right? Because the, there really now is evidence that hands-on learning helps children with retention. Can I can I throw an idea at you for your uh, beanbag poetry? Yeah. Um, here, this is a fun one. Doing a um, doing a poem or learning lines for a play or memorizing something. Mm-hmm. Uh, stand a, a certain distance apart from the partner, and the rule is when you toss the beanbag. And you're only allowed to say the line while the beanbag is in the air. Mm-hmm. And it has to, and the line has to start the second it leaves your hand and finish the second it leaves your partner's hand. And wow. then you can adjust the, the, the distance apart based yes. on how, you know, how long the line is. And uh, there's so much there as far as communication and having your voice be heard and having your voice travel a certain amount of time, but it doesn't have to be that complicated. It's just, just fun little, little things to throw in. 
That is great. Oh my gosh. We used to, um, this isn't a beanbag story, but it's a marching uh, story where we would say, sometimes do our opening births. Um, I would make the kids all get their coats on and we would go outside and we'd walk around the house saying the opening verse because in the wintertime, it's just here in Ohio, it can be kind of gray and frozen. So it's harder to get outside. So that was just a good way to have a short, limited time outside, but get some extra movement in and fresh air. <laughs> so <laughs> That is so great. I could see tying that in with the uh, sixth grade uh... Roman history too. <laughs> well, so oh, so that's another thing is that learning games from the cultures that you're studying is a wonderful yeah. thing because there are childhood games from every single culture. Um, both, you know, you can extend this even beyond games into the art and poetry and, and music of those cultures too. But it's really, I find, I have found that it's often a forgotten, like not thought of, uh, approach to see what childhood games were played in ancient Greece or in, you know, ancient India. That right. can be a fascinating. And Payne does a great job of pulling all that together. For sure. Yeah, for sure. I remember being terrified that I was, I was going to have to learn how to sing and play <laughs> as a teacher. <laughs> <laughs> That's so funny. Oh my goodness. Yeah. Yeah. Well, we each have our own strengths, but it's back to that striving, isn't it? <laughs> yeah, that's all it is. As long as they see us striving, that is, that can, we, we can wrap it up with that, right? That we hope that um, our students or our children's memories of us are that, that we did our best. Perfect. Perfect. Oh my gosh. Thank you. This is so much fun, Brian. Thank you um, so much for having me. Thank you. And Brian and Robin uh, of Waldorf Fish will again this year be uh, presenting at Taproot, the Taproot teacher training. So I'm super excited about that. And uh, Brian, let our listeners know where they can find you. Yes, waldorffish.com. Um, we have some free sample lessons there. You can get an idea of, um, uh, of what we do and who our teachers are and find us on Instagram at Walderfish. That is so fun. Yeah, and Walderfish now, um, I, I don't know how many listeners are familiar with you, but many uh, homeschoolers that I work with know that you offer the art uh, course and the weekly art classes, which are fabulous, I will say. Um, but also are now you're now Walderfish is now offering um, you know, the form drawing science, geometry. So please, uh dear listeners, if you have not explored Walderfish, go go have a look. And thank you, thank you, Brian. This was really fun. Um, we'll have to, we'll have to do this again, uh, and share more stories. I'd love to have a conversation with you about art. Thanks so much. We could probably go for hours. I think we could. So <laughs> thanks again for joining me today. And all of you listeners, if you want to, uh, there'll be some links to any of the resources we've mentioned over in the show notes. So you can hop on over to artofhomeschooling.com slash episode 27. Thanks again, Brian. Thank you. That's all for today, my friend. But here's what I want you to remember. Rather than perfection, let's focus on connection. Thanks so much for listening, and I'll see you on the next episode of the Art of Homeschooling podcast. Thank you.